So I'm going to give a brief introduction and then turn it over very shortly to Jay, who has a massive amount of data to present. Um, we first want to um, express our deep uh, gratitude to Paul Allen and the Foundation uh, and to um, Kathy and Tom uh, for their support organizing this meeting and making this all possible. So the C. elegans fate map uh, is a roadmap to development that in part was responsible for Solston and colleagues' 2005 Nobel Prize. It was constructed very laboriously by sitting at a microscope and actually recording the birth of all cells during worm development over the better part of a day. Um, and when you can look at an exploded view, it actually gives you the precise lineage history of all the developed cells in the worm. Um, and while we possess this very fundamental um, milestone uh, that has contributed enormously to developmental biology for the worm, we're lacking it for other model organisms and in particular Homo sapiens. Uh, and it's not so easy to do in other um, living things and that's because um, we have, are dealing not with a thousand cells but with millions or trillions of cells. Uh, these organisms are not transparent, take a long time to develop, um, and consequently different approaches have been utilized in order to try to map cell fate, um, including the very elegant studies of Nicole Le Durand, who performed uh, transplants of quail to make quail-chicken hybrids, but one can imagine that that can only go so far. Um, then there are the very elegant um, uh, spectrally distinguishable fluorescent proteins epitomized by the development of Brainbow. But an important point to make about that uh, technique is that it clonally marks populations of cells. And clonality can only get you so far. Um, at the simplest level, we are all clones of a zygote. If you look at a tumor, um, that's frequently uh, expressed and emphasized that it has clonal origins in a single cell, yet we now know there's tremendous subclonal heterogeneity. Uh, and so if you have as few as four cells, there are actually 15 different cell lineage histories. And if you double that number to eight, there are 135,000 different cell histories and go up to 16 and it soon approaches Avogadro's number. And the point is, is that within a clone, there's a tremendous amount of precise lineage information that can't be resolved. So what one needs is a virtually li limitless supply uh, of markers. Um, Steve Salaponte and our group first address the possibility of using sporadically arising somatic mutations in order to resolve lineage. And this works, um, but it works to a certain extent. Michael had uh, very nicely summarized some of the limitations of the approach, that the mutations are hard to find. However, you can identify them using brute, for brute force approaches as um, Michael Stratton and colleagues did when they sequenced the whole genome of many individual cells that have been amplified from a mouse through embryoid body formation and were able to construct precise deterministic lineages. Um, however, due to the limited number of mutations that were identified, the cell trees could only go so deep. Um, with uh, that in mind, Jay is going to tell you about a um, new engineered approach um, that uh, has turned out uh, to work incredibly well. Okay, so I had this, I had this slide in here. Um, this was actually my, this was my first project in graduate school. Was, uh, I think, inspired by uh, some of the work that Chris Walsh had done actually when, when he was a postdoc with Connie Sepko and, and some other work going on at Harvard at the time. I was, you know, thinking about this idea of how to multiplex uh, uh, lineage tracing. And so um, this was maybe 15 or 16 years ago. Um, came up with ideas that I think echoed some of the things that uh, uh, Michael and Long talked about with their terrific system and also um, similar to the rainbow system. And I, I worked on this for six months, uh, uh, threw up my arms in, in failure and went on to work on, on something, some other things. Um, but kind of had this in the, in the back of my head. And, and I actually, you know, even in starting my lab, I didn't really pick back up on, on it. I knew that Marshall had been working in similar areas. and. It wasn't actually until I think I got the email from Kathy 
about this that Marshall and I reconnected about this and I started uh, working on this again um, uh, with him. So, um, okay. So the, the, the system, I think uh, the, you'll see some similarities with um, uh, memoir that, that Michael presented, but also some, um, I think, complementary uh, differences. Uh, is the idea of using um, CRISPR-Cas9 as a means of recording um, uh, uh, lineage information. And so um, there's a lot of advantages here. I think the, 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 the focus that, or the system that we came up with involved trying to pack as much information content as we could into a, a, a compact space. And so this was work that was led by uh, two graduate students, uh, Aaron McKenna and, and Greg Finley. Um, okay, so uh, I'll just walk through uh, uh, how this works. So um, our, our acronym or <laughs> is uh, Gestalt. I like memoir a little better. It's a little more um, uh, fitting to the method. But uh, so, so we have got a, a, a barcode here that consists of about 10 target sites for um, guide RNAs. And um, the idea is that as development progresses, you have um, accumulation of uh, uh, point mutations, but more often insertion and deletions through non-homologous end joining, um, but different events in, in different cells, meaning different precise mutations. Um, even if a given site is edited, it can be edited in, in many different ways. Um, and then that these uh, uh, accumulate um, irreversibly um, and combinatorially um, into this relatively compact space that we can then, um, in principle, read out by, by sequencing. And then the, the uh, lineage information is, is recovered from uh, the sharing of edits between, between cells. So um, we did do some cell culture work prior to this. I'm just going to skip to the, um, the animal experiment where we tried to um, take what we thought was a working system in cell culture and put it into a fish. And so this was for this, we teamed up with uh, Alex Shear's group and, in particular, uh, a uh, terrific postdoc, uh, Jimmy Gagnon, um, there, who led a lot of the fish work here. So um, uh, one of the advantages here of trying it in fish is that we could try it very quickly. Uh, so we have this, this barcode that we put in um, to adult zebrafish as a transgenic, um, and then we can um, inject uh, all of the editing reagents, including guides corresponding to each of these 10 targets um, uh, and Cas9 into single-cell embryos. And then we just let um, development proceed through through embryogenesis and then uh, uh, onward to adult stages. So um, while we were waiting for the adults to grow up, we could take a bunch of these embryos and, and look at them to see if this was working. Um, and so uh, one, one thing that we see here is that we do see a lot of allele. So when we sequence over the barcode region, this is just PCRing and sequencing that, that barcode, we see um, uh, diversity accumulate. So even though we have only 10 target sites, we're accumulating um, thousands of unique alleles. And if we compare different embryos to each other, we don't see sharing of alleles, which convinces us that they, they real, when we see the same allele twice in a given uh, embryo, it's truly by descent rather than by chance. Um, the other uh, thing we noticed here, so every, every uh, group here um, uh, corresponds to a developmental time point going across here, and every, every bar is a different embryo. And so, um, uh, even though we see more alleles later in time because we're sampling more cells, most of the editing happens relatively early. So we're not encoding the editing reagents genomically, and so you can imagine they just crap out after a certain number of cell divisions rather than, than continuing to edit. Okay, so this is uh, what the uh, uh, semi-partially semi processed data looks like. So every line here represents a, uh, a unique allele. And uh, the histogram over here is showing how many cells we're seeing that allele in. And we primarily focus on insertions and deletions because of the, the bioinformatic challenges with, with these kind of data. Um, uh, and so the blue bars are insertions, the reds are deletions. And as you can see, um, uh, there's quite a diversity. We also see that certain editing events are shared between cells. So for example, um, uh, uh, almost exactly half of the cells in this particular embryo have an insertion at this first site, uh, which is consistent with an editing event that happened at the two-cell stage. Right? OK. So um, uh, the informatics here are, are challenging. So most, most software for kind of phylogenetic inference in, in the genomic space was developed around uh, you know, point mutations that occur in evolutionary time. And here we're dealing with a very different um, uh, matrix of, of uh, likelihoods for different kinds of mutations. Um, but we are able, we were able to come up with software for inferring phylogenetic trees 
um, based on the alleles that we, that we observe, right? So here, for example, this is a clade, and you can see that every member of this clade is defined by, um, or shares a common pair of, of edits, right? And therefore, we can group them together. And then you have subgroups that, that have dependent edits that are only present in uh, subsets of the alleles. So, um, okay, so this is, this is one portion of the, the overall tree. So if we zoom out, um, we have these, these, so this just keeps wrapping over, um, but we have these uh, Selston-like trees where we have over a thousand uh, alleles that we're able to pull together into this, this uh, single tree. And this was from a 30-hour um, uh, embryo. And I think at most we're getting probably eight or nine levels uh, in terms of the depth of the, the tree that we have. Um, Okay, so so it seemed to be working. So we waited a few months, uh, got our uh, adult zebrafish, and so um, so in the, in the embryo experiments, we're just sampling cells. We don't know what cells are are, are who. Uh, we do a little bit better here. We're able to separately sample different organs from the fish, and and look at the the alleles that contribute to them. So remember, all of the editing happened early. So we're really looking at those 1,300 or so alleles and kind of what contributions they're making to. Uh, different organs. And so we did a more focused analysis in the heart where we um, took off a chunk. We also sorted out cardiomyocytes and non-cardiomyocytes um, to look in a little more detail. Um, so, so one nice thing here when you're using sequencing, you're able to sample an incredibly large number of cells. So here we're able to look at uh, nearly 200,000 cells from diverse organs, um, but these boil down to around 1,000 alleles, right? So we're seeing each allele uh, in, in many cells. Okay, so one, one surprising finding, and we've seen this again, uh, the numbers and the proportions are obviously not always the same, but we've seen this in a few different fish, is that only a handful of alleles um, contribute to uh, blood, right? So one thing I didn't know before getting into this is that uh, zebrafish blood, red blood cells are nucleated. And first we just thought we had some weird contamination of these five alleles in every tissue, then we realized it was just blood. Um, so if you sort out the blood and look at it separately, we see these five alleles that account for um, almost all of blood. Um, and then if we look at each organ, um, those same alleles are present at kind of the same ratios relative to each other, right? So they're, they're just, they're, they're there, uh, quote, contaminating, except for the sorted cardiomyocytes, which obviously are, are, don't have blood. Um, and so when we look more broadly at organs, uh, organ systems, um, we see a similar trend. So this is a histogram of the fraction of cells that are explained by um, uh, 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 the most dominant alleles, where the alleles correspond to um, these marked early progenitors. And so the blood is the histogram in red, where you can see almost all of it's explained by a few. But, but for every adult tissue that we looked at, six or fewer barcodes account for more than half of the organ, right? Um, uh, so, so, and you can ask, like, well, are these the same alleles that are present in different organs? Are they sharing across different organs. And for the most part, um, the finding is that the, prevalent, the alleles that are preva prevalent in any given organ are not prevalent in other organs, right? And there are some exceptions to that. So maybe we see some sharing between different parts of the intestine. Um, uh, and also, if we're looking at the, the heart in uh, greater detail, so that's, that's one barcode we see in the heart, but it's not really prevalent in any other organ. Um, and this big block of alleles that are related to each other are all different, uh, uh, all come from the heart. Right, so that may explain that, that sharing. So um, just as a, as, a, as a hat tip to our uh, afternoon experience yesterday, we, um, when we were putting together this paper, we initially tried to actually represent this as Mondrian-type um, uh, uh, art. Um, and so Jamie Gagnon, the, the postdoc I mentioned, um, uh, loved this, as did I. Uh, and so we made these, these nice pictures. So you can see um, so the diversity in, in terms of the embryo uh, versus the adult, and then looking in specific organs like blood, which has um, very little diversity, or even brain, which, which doesn't have so much. A lot of alleles, but a few alleles explaining uh, most of it. But we were outvoted by our colleagues, and this didn't uh, end up making it. Um, okay, so this is the overall lineage of the adult. Uh, uh, just over a thousand alleles in, in across the whole um, organism here. I'm going to speed up a little bit here for time. So. So if you, go, if, if you go back a slide here, so you can see that, that if you look in a little more detail, you can see that there are kind of these major clades, right? So big groups, about eight big groups of cells that are, are, we can relate to each other 
on the basis of what were likely very early edits in the embryo. And so here I'm just zooming in on one of those. And then we can look at, if we look in, at the organs in which those alleles appear, uh, it looks a bit all over the place, but we do see non-uniformity in terms of a, a progenitors uh, defined by all the descendants of, these, uh, of this guy here and how they contribute to, to different organs. So for example, um, uh, this is looking at these eight uh, inferred progenitors, and uh, we can see that some of them contribute to many organ systems, but others, um, even though you know, we may have thousands of, of cells represented, only contribute to neuroectoderm or only contribute to mesoderm. So uh, uh, we can look at this in a, a, a more nuanced way, um, going from an ancestral edit to successive additions of, of, of more edits on top of that, and we can, we can, we can kind of watch or, or visualize increasing amounts of restriction in terms of the organs in which we see um, uh, those alle uh, alleles um, or groups of alleles uh, appearing in. Okay, so, um, so what's next? So we've, we've been trying to, you know, one great thing about CRISPR-based systems is that you can, in principle, port them to any model organism that uh, CRISPR works in, which is, as thus far, we haven't really seen the limit of. Um, I think one major limitation uh, of the way that we've done this and the difference from, let's say, a Sulston-like map is that we don't, you know, other than a very gross picture of anatomy, we're lacking information as to what each of these cells are. Right? and also where they are, right? so, so spatially where they are and, and functionally who they are. Um, so I thought, I, I think Michael and Long's work really nicely addresses the, the spatial piece. Um, we've been trying to um, uh, uh, focus on functional identity to, to try and get more out of this lineage information by also trying to, cut, to concurrently capture functional information on each cell that we're sampling. And so, um, our lab, and I know many others have been working on single cell techniques. Um, we've been trying to develop an atlas of chromatin state in the mouse. And so um, this is based on a single cell ataxy protocol uh, that we developed. And we're over 100,000 cells now. I should emphasize this is not a, like a major production thing. This is work from a, um, a postdoc and a technician over maybe uh, two months. Um, and we can do this because we rely on this kind of split pool method that gets uh, is, is high throughput. And so, um, you know, we can take these data sets, we can break them into clusters and, you, you know, compare them to single cell RNA-seq and see similar kinds of clusters that we can map back. But obviously, we'd like to have lineage information on top of this. And so, um, one of the graduate students had the foresight to put the, the barcode uh, uh, under expression. So, we, we have it in RNA and, in principle, can recover it in single cell RNA-seq data sets. So, we've just started to, to, to do this. Um, this is actually, this results just from the last, like, maybe 72 hours or something like that. Um, so this is a, a single cell RNA-seq data set of about 600 cells from one of the Gestalt uh, zebrafish embryos. Um, and so you see these clusters. We can break these down into different uh, cell types based on markers that are overrepresented. Um, and then in a proportion of these cells, we're also getting the lineage barcode. And so we can also reconstruct a Gestalt-like history and then map what cells uh, we're seeing over here to, to the lineage information. And so we don't have a great way to visualize this yet, but at least for blood, um, we see something very consistent, which is the, the blood that we're seeing here in the, in the uh, uh, this is an embryo, or blood-like cells in the embryo. Remember, we didn't dissect this, um, uh, correspond to just a handful of, of barcodes in the, in the lineage tree. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll stop there. I'm probably over. Uh, so again, I think that you know, where this is headed is really um, an integration. I think we, we want lineage histories, but we also want them to be coupled to, uh, I think, not just uh, molecular profiling data sets, but also uh, spatial information to really kind of put the, the whole story together. Um, and I'll stop there. I'll just add my, my thanks to Marshall. This has been um, one of the funnest meetings I've attended, or probably the funnest in, in memory. Um, and uh, thank you to, to uh, Tom and Kathy and Nicole for, for organizing. It's been really uh, terrific. So. Questions? Michael. Yeah, really beautiful talk and great system. And I'm just wondering whether um, there's any correlation between the diversity of barcodes that you get and the stage of development at which a particular organ uh, starts to expand or proliferate? 
so, so the, one, explana one interpretation of the data is that certain cells take over early. Another interpretation is that there's late remodeling of organs and sort of late stage dominance. I, I don't think we know yet. I think we have to go through and do more of a time series to really get a handle on that. The one precedent for this that I think encouraged us to believe the result was real is that uh, there's work in, in the heart, zebrafish heart, that shows that there's late stage remodeling where certain clones take over, right? And so it might, that might be a general, gen, more generally be the case, right? Chris. So uh, that's really beautiful work. Uh, did you say there's uh, most tissues have contributions from like about eight major clades or something like that? Uh, I said that most, oh, you mean how many, most tissues have contribution, most tissue, the majority of most tissues, or all tissues, uh -huh. was six or seven alleles. Um, if you look at the clades, I would, I would say most of the clades are actually contributing to most of the organs. There are a handful of clades that only appear to contribute to, let's say, neuroectoderm or, or mesoderm or so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, I don't, how, do you, how are you distinguishing alleles from clades? So clade. You mean alleles meaning alleles meaning the final, the final allele, thing. and then the clade, clade being the, meaning the, the founder. third progenitor, a group of alleles that all share some early edit. Uh, okay, great. Right. Uh, I guess, and then the last question is, uh, so um, assuming the, 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 the alleles are very tissue restricted, the clades are not so much, but you can see some restriction. Okay. So assuming that you know humans are similar to zebrafish in terms of the early differentiation of blood from other tissues, is how good or bad do you think blood is as a proxy for, say, somatic mutations in other tissues? Is it good for some tissues and not others? Is it, is it bad for all? Or what, what do you think? What's your general sense? That is a great question. Um, I, mean, I think it's worth actually a focused analysis to try and assess that based on the data. Obviously, doing it in mouse would yield a more um, relevant result. But in principle, one could do that analysis directly from this kind of data. We just haven't done it. Um, but my gut feeling is that for, for early events, you would see them in blood. Uh, actually, well, I'm not so sure, actually. I, I'm not so sure. I, I would just um, add that people, there's a lot of selective um, pressures that accumulate with age, and so a huge um, area of investigation in hematology is clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, but that is, you know, a pre-neoplastic phenomenon that's well beyond looking at developmental origins. If you were to look back, I think maybe only two of the clades contributed to blood, right? So only two of the, the only two, because some of those five alleles were actually related to each other, so.